Oh man, gorgeous day today. It's been a long drive. I've driven now for almost two days straight. So I drove about 14 and a half hours yesterday. I'm still driving today. I've been at it since about seven this morning. It's almost two o'clock. But you know, it's totally worth it. I'm coming from Texas to Wyoming to look at a whole bunch of stuff from Precambrian all the way up through the Cenozoic. And nowadays, with gas prices being what they are, and I'm driving something that sucks up a lot of fuel, a dually with a camp run back, um, you know, you got to get your money's worth out of these trips. So I'm looking at everything and anything I can that's of geological interest, including these features that are on the horizon behind me and across the road behind me on this side. This is Highway 287 coming from Fort Collins, Colorado to the south to Laramie, Wyoming up north. We're going to go there and beyond. But I'm just outside a little town called Virginia Dale. These outcrops are not something I'm used to talking about on the rock rama. These are not sedimentary rocks. They're not clastics. They're actually crystalline basement. They're granites and pegmatites and metamorphics and all kinds of interesting things. And they're part of what's called a ring dike complex. And on the horizon behind me, all these ridges are part of this ring dike complex. And a ring dike complex is exactly what it sounds like. It's a complex of dikes. In other words, igneous intrusives that have shot up and squirted up in a vertical way. A sill is a horizontal layer of igneous rock that's come in. Think of like a window sill. A dike is like a dam, a dike, a baffle. So these things have shot up and they've formed concentric rings. They very likely form in a caldera. So in other words, in a magma chamber, underground, you have a big open area with a lot of molten rock in there, the magma. And as that chamber starts to collapse on itself from above, it creates these concentric faults, these concentric rings that then the magma, the melt, can squirt up into as it collapses down. So that's what's happened here. It didn't happen recently. It happened about 2.7 billion with a B years ago. And it happened before North America was even a continent. In fact, this is one of the little micro cratons that agglutinated with other ones and annealed to form the North American craton. So this is one of those terrains, they're called, one of these little microcontinental chunks of Pluton that have welded together to form what we have in North America today. And we're gonna run across the road and take a look at them and discuss sort of some of the textures and some of the compositions. Now, I'm not an igneous geologist, as will be abundantly clear when I start talking about this stuff, so bear with me. Uh, there's a lot of papers out there you can find on this. There's even some virtual uh, field guides from various trips that have been run out here. Uh, CSU in Colorado leads field trips here, UW leads field trips here. There's a lot of information. That's where I got most of what I'm about to tell you. All right, so here's our first stop at this outcrop. And it's kind of interesting because it's an overall mafic, um, maybe a nice, uh, it's nice, but it's nice with a G. Um, so it's a mafic rock with these feldspars, pink feldspars, which is suggesting you have different chemical compounds coming out of the melt. So you've got a mixed melt that's got felsics and mafix, and they have different crystallizing points. So you've got these little blebs of felsic minerals in an overall mafic rock, which is kind of interesting. Um, all throughout here, I'm going to show you up and down, there's fractures in this mafic material and there's granitic squirts of this felsic material. Uh, so there's some and the grays, the earth, the grays, the project based feldspar, and some quartz. Um, and we'll keep looking and see some of the really coarse grain material in some of those dikes. Um, and those would be pegmatites. Pegmatites are coarse and fine grain, very poorly sorted um, igneous rocks. And they're mined out here because a lot of the minerals that form in them, like micas and whatnot, have industrial application, increasingly so. So this is all part of the Sherman granite complex. The granite in here is the Sherman granite, that 2.7 billion year old granite. And the matrix is something else. Um, I mentioned the dikes before within this. So there's the ring dike structure where these things are squirting up. But here's actual little fracture filling dikes in the matrix. Now, matrix have a quenching temperature that's way above granite and uh, pegmatite. In other words, they solidify 
at a lot hotter temperature than the lighter color material. So probably what's happening is in this magma chamber, in this melt, you got the darker, what's called mafic minerals solidifying first and forming these um, proto rocks basically. They're then fracturing as they continue to cool or as the thing collapses. And then the melt, which can tolerate cooler temperatures, squirts in and eventually solidifies and forms these granites and these pegmatites. Now it's sort of interesting, some of these have a very rounded structure to them. So some of these mafics don't look jagged, they're kind of rounded. Um, here's a nice thing here, look at that. Very rounded, which is giving you the impression that maybe it wasn't totally solid. Maybe they're kind of um, partly squishy when this is happening. I don't know, I'm making this up. I'm not really an igneous guy. But it doesn't look like a simple fracture. It looks like these things are partly melted or kind of squishy when the pegmatite came, when the granite came in. So we've got different melts here. We've got the dark mafix, the light felsix. You know, again, here's that kind of rounded structure. Oh, it's a lizard. Hey, what back to what I was saying before I got distracted by the lizard. Um, we've got different chemistries of melts in this magma chamber, and each one has its own preferred um, cooling temperature, preferred solidifying temperature. It's also possible you have some what's called xenoliths, uh, some of this dark stuff has been interpreted as xenoliths. In other words, rocks that have kind of fallen into the melt or, or weren't part of the melt originally might have collapsed in from the magma chamber. So some of these might be essentially the roof or the ceiling that's kind of collapsing into the cooling granite. And as with most things geological, there's multiple interpretations. But if you look at the aerial view, and we're going to do that right now, so you can see on this aerial view of the Virginia Dale Ring Dyke Complex, these nice concentric circles composed of the granitic and the mafic rocks that represent the collapsing caldera and the cooling of the magma. And now that we're back on the ground, you can see what they look like in outcrop. So these things are, as I mentioned before, they're being mined. Kimberlites, uh, which are diamond pipes, are similar in some ways to this. Diamonds form in the mantle. It's not like what you've heard or what you saw with Superman, where Superman takes a lump of coal and squeezes it and makes a diamond. Um, that's an old wives' tale. Diamonds actually probably form from pure carbon in mantle rock like this, uh, but they can be dragged up to the surface uh, in explosive kimberlites, which are essentially diamond pipe volcanoes related to intrusions like this. So 2.7 billion years ago, this melted chamber was cooling, collapsing, and you get all kinds of different chemistries solidifying at different temperatures, partly falling in, remelting, resolidifying. So the lighting is not the best for this. And it's not so bad actually. But you can see the original host rock, that dark mafic rock, has been shattered, fractured, and kind of maybe even tumbled in to the cooling pink magma, which forms the granite. So granite is a felsic um, rock, a felsic igneous rock made of a clays plagiar clays, quartz, micas, and the more mafix like the gneisses um, and so on are the darker material. But you can see it's kind of got that patchwork, that fracture network. You can easily picture that dark rock being broken up, collapsed, tumbled in, maybe reworked, and then squirted in and infilled with the granite. Take a look at this. This is a famous polka dot outcrop. Um, it's featured in a lot of geological photographs. Almost every field stop takes a look at this stuff. It's really cool looking. It almost looks like a mosaic somebody put together out of tiles and chunks of rock, but it's natural. It's 100% natural. And again, what you're seeing is those dark mafic rocks that melt at a lot, or sorry, they solidify at a lot higher temperature than the lighter colored granite, which stays liquid a lot longer. There's a couple of interpretations of this outcrop right here. One is that you're looking at something sort of like a lava lamp. So you have different viscosities, different chemistries of fluids, and you can almost picture these dark rocks um, being blobs moving within the gel of the lighter colored material, and the lighter colored material cools after. So in other words, this dark material is kind of forming these blobs, almost like chocolate chip ice cream. Um, and then afterwards, the light colored material solidifies and you get what looks like this polka dot chocolate chip ice cream. There's another idea that this dark material actually didn't just come out of the melt separately because it cools at a different temperature, but that it represents material that's collapsed in 
and got mixed into the magma chamber prior to cooling. Um, in reality, it's probably a combination of both. Things are seldom A or B, um, yes or no. There's usually a sort of, well, mostly, but could be something else. So my money is on probably the lava lamp store is a good one. We had different chemical compositions, different chemistries, different cooling temperatures of these things. But you figure if you're in a caldera that's also collapsing, chunks of that dark material would have been periodically getting dumped into the light-colored magma. So you likely do have chunks of xenoliths, clasts, whatever you want to call them, coming out of that dark roofing material in the walls into the light-colored melt, as well as the original stuff getting cooled in the melt, like a lava lamp. Okay, so I've just driven a little bit further north on the 287. The outcrops we were just on are up around the corner there. That's where the ring dike complex is. Now we're in the main body of that magma. This is the Sherman granite. And you can tell just by looking at this outcrop behind me, it's all pretty much one color, kind of salmon color, orangish pink. Grain size, the crystal size, I keep saying grain size because I'm a sedimentary geologist, I should say the crystal size. It's all pretty homogenous. They're all about the same size. So we have quartz, feldspars, you know, orthoclase and plagioclase, um, different felsic minerals like that. And they're all about the same size, which is different than what we saw back there where we had big crystals, small crystals, tiny little crystals in the mafix. And I didn't really talk about it back there at the dike, I should have, but generally crystal size uh, can indicate how fast something cooled. Um, something that cools over a long period of time and grows big crystals. Think of it as melted glass. If you melt some glass, it gets all nice and liquidy, and you let it cool, you get a single big chunk of glass. If you cool it instantly, by taking that melted glass and putting it in cold water, millions of tiny little crystals form instantly and it basically explodes because you have instant crystallization of tiny little crystals. So generally, if you have tiny crystals, it cooled rapidly. Bigger crystals mean it cooled over a longer period of time. If they're all about the same size, that kind of makes sense in a body like this that was um, underground in a caldera because it's telling you it cooled over a certain amount of time pretty homogenous. All right, we're going to keep going and take a look at some other stuff in Wyoming. Okay, so now I'm on the northern side of that complex that includes the main body of the Pluton of that caldera and the ring dikes that surround it when that caldera collapsed. So again, on the aerial view, looking at it right now, I'm on the northernmost extreme. And looking back that way, that's the south towards Colorado. Uh, I'm in Wyoming now. I crossed over the border a couple of moments before. And behind me here is a mine in the northernmost part of that ring dike structure. Funny story, a couple of months ago, I did a video on this mine. Uh, because years and years ago, a professor I'd had at the university said that this was a kimberlite mine. In other words, a diamond pipe. So I made a nice little YouTube video. It was about five, ten minutes. Talked about kimberlites and how they form. Um, and I posted it up and a bunch of really attentive and surprisingly polite and thoughtful people pointed out it's actually not a kimberlite, it's a pegmatite mine. Um, so that got me thinking that, wow, I really need to look into this a little bit more. And sure enough, this is part of that pegmatite ring dike complex that surrounds the main caldera body of the Sherman granite in there. So this is a great example of a mine where they're stripping out minerals, uh, those mafix, those little fine grained dark colored blobs of stuff I told you about, sorry, fine crystal, not fine grained, um, dark blobs of material that we saw on the Southern end. That's being probably mined out here uh, for a variety of minerals that are being used in industrial applications. It's been active for at least as long as I was in grad school and undergrad, so we're talking like the early to mid 90s, that was being mined and it's active again now. You can see on Google Earth images like this one, um, it's actually being re-dug out even more than it was in the 90s. So somebody's gotten some interest in this. Uh, not surprising with the value of minerals, value of everything going up lately. Uh, there's a lot more revisiting of these old mines to see if you can get some more um, use out of them. So again, we're on the northern part of that fringing ring dike complex that sits on the outskirts of that big 
solidified mass of plutonic granite. Different sizes of crystals in the ring dikes, different chemistries of the ring dikes. They represent different types of melts that were squirting up after the collapse of the caldera, whereas the caldera itself was taking its time just kind of cooling nice and homogeneously. So you got these different textures, different structures and everything. All right, so that's been, again, my little arm-waving song and dance about intrusives, igneous rocks, dikes, calderas. Not going to be any more of that on this trip. That's it. I, I've said what I know about these things at this point. So from here on out, I'm going to get back to said strat, trays, fossils, and the stuff I'm familiar with. But I hope you thought this was at least a little bit interesting or uh, entertaining. <laughs>